think it was a well-educated man. Can you please tell us what levelling up is? Yes, I will try. Uh, the point of it is to avoid, get away from the distortions we have in the UK economy. So a lot of the wealth of the UK economy is based in London and the South East, and that is one of the richest parts of the world. You then move away from London and you find that we've got parts of the country that have GDP per capita that is much more lowly ranked. And what do you do to change that? Mm -hmm. Well, it's things like building roads. It's making sure that people are connected. It's putting out um, super fast broadband so that people can do business in the countryside as well as in cities. Leveling up is ensuring that a fair share of taxpayers' cash okay. goes to other parts of the country. OK, well, if that's the case, then, why is the South East getting so much money? Because there are bits of the South East that aren't well connected as well. It, my own constituency is a very good example of this. Um, I have some parts of North East Somerset that are very successful and very prosperous. But some of the areas that tend to, to have been the old mining areas, and mm. people forget Somerset mm. had a strong coal mining mm. tradition, have been left behind. And giving them some help, some support, to compete with areas that are only a few miles away is something that it's important to do. All right. And, and there was a great distortion. I would say many problems in this country come from Treasury analytics, but that's perhaps a different discussion. <laughs> uh, the, the, the Treasury spent money dependent upon what it saw as the return on investment. Now, you'd say that was normally very sensible, but that meant your return was always greater in London and the South East, because London and the South East was yeah. richer to start with. Yeah. And so there was a change in the Green Book to make it easier to have capital expenditure, taxpayers' money, of course, outside. Well, that's all well and good, Jacob. You know, government putting a bit of money here, a bit of money there, building a road, I get it. However, you and I both know that actually generally, for all of us to become richer in this country, better off in this country, it needs success in the private sector. It's the private sector that generates wealth, that generates taxes, without which we can't have a health service or anything else. Now, I've been very critical of much of this government's economic policy, and overnight we see a really coruscating article from James Dyson, basically saying that the government's economics is short-sighted. He even uses the word stupid. He says you cannot just go on taxing private companies without people leaving the country. The Conservative Party are now, we are now witnessing under a Conservative government a brain drain we haven't seen since the 1970s. What is going on? Well, we're at the highest tax rate for 70 years. Uh, James Dyson, Sir James Dyson, is an absolutely mm. brilliant man. Um, completely understands what he's talking about, understands his business, and has made a huge success of investing yeah. in this country. So is he right? And one should listen very carefully to what he says. I, I, mean, I think we have got too big a state full stop. We spend too much money, and to pay for that, uh, we tax too highly. And we need to be more realistic about this. We need to cut expenditure. We need to look at what we're spending money on. We need to root out wasteful expenditure. But it's more than that. We've got to work out what is the state trying to do. Mm. And it seems to me it tries to do too much. And the only way to get to lower taxation is if the state tries to do less and does what it does do better. But that's the bizarre thing. We've now had a Conservative government, albeit in coalition for the first few years. Now since 2010, we've seen a bigger expansion of the state under the Conservatives than we did in the previous decade under Labour. And when for a millisecond a Conservative Chancellor of the Exchequer tries to reduce the size of the state by a pretty modest half a percent. Everyone goes crazy and they get sacked. I mean, this is really my point to you. The Conservative Party and the Labour Party are now virtually indistinguishable on these big philosophical principles, such as the size of a state, whatever your own personal view may be. I wouldn't go quite as far as that. Um, you see that uh, Sir Keir Starmer wants to I think he wants to nationalise the um, energy industry. So there, and he wants yeah. to nationalise GPs. So uh, there is still red and tooth and claw socialism within the Labour Party. Mm. You may say there isn't enough blue in tooth and claw conservatism I'm within not sure the Conservative I see Party. Well, I, I think you're a bit unfair, but but but, um, <laughs> but, but not wholly. But not wholly unfair. No, I I, I think partly, well, partly circumstances one goes through it. There was the coalition to begin with. Mm -hmm. Now, that really hobbled us because the Lib Dems stopped us doing the most conservative things that we would have done. Then we have very, very small majorities. 
So Theresa May, even if she'd wanted to do bold things, which is slightly moot point, uh, didn't have a majority to get them through. Mm. Then Boris wins a large majority and is immediately hit by COVID, which even I thought justified an increase in state expenditure. I thought we had to ensure that businesses could survive because if suddenly you go from sending a, selling 100 dinners an evening to zero, you are out of business. But if we hadn't locked down, if we'd done what Sweden did and what Ron DeSantis did in Florida, things would have been very well, well, different. Well, I, that's very interesting. I was actually having lunch with somebody who is Swedish, and he was saying to me that the Swedish restaurants were still empty because everyone was told, don't go out. It was legal to go out, ah. but people self regulated. Well, now, I can promise you that in Florida, and well, I was in I, Florida during lockdown, and... I, I happen to agree with you. I think we need... The real thing the COVID inquiry should do is to look at whether lockdown was proportionate, because I think it wasn't. Now, I fully bought into the first lockdown. Uh, I, I wasn't raising questions about it at that point. Um, but lots of people were raising questions later on. Yeah. And if the inquiry doesn't look at that, it will be pointless. If it just looks at should we have locked down earlier, it will be really silly. No, I agree. And, I, you know, and there also needs to be a, a, an open debate around the vaccine. There are a significant number of people concerned about vaccine harms. And, and I'm, you know, I'm not getting into the wild conspiracy theories, but I do think a proper open debate on that is justified. Well, I tend to think that if you have an open debate, it reassures people. But the thing that makes people most nervous is if you're not, not willing to discuss yeah. it and if you try and shut down debate. Uh, ha having said that, I think what one of my um, parliamentary colleague said was deeply irresponsible uh, and just went... Well, he used it, a word... He, he went off the reservation uh, <coughs> in, in Yeah, I mean, the said. word that Bridgen used, and he said it was from, a, uh, from, from an Israeli doctor, but the word, quite frankly, any reference to the Holocaust in yeah. any context isn't helpful, and, and I totally get that. Jacob, you know, you, you, you are a high-profile, well-known political figure. You've held very senior office. You're now on the back benches. What can Jacob Rees-Mogg do as a backbencher that he couldn't do as a minister? Um, probably rather more in some ways than as a minister. Um, I can come talk to you much more easily, which sure. is great, uh, that you don't have um, very good briefings, it has to be said, but very de detailed briefings as to what you're allowed to say and what you're not meant to say. I wasn't necessarily the best at following, <laughs> but I, I tried quite hard. Um, you can be involved in the public debate again, mm. whereas when you're a minister, you're limited very much to your specific area. And in government, I found it was much easier to stop things than to make things happen. It, it, it's easier to block than to push forward. And from the outside, you can be a much more open part of the political debate. You're much freer to speak. Well, that's a very good thing. So, Nicola Sturgeon's law, vetoed by Sunak, has he got this one right? Yes, he has. Um, I mean, he's got it right on the narrow legal constitutional ground that it conflicts with a UK-wide Act of Parliament. Yes. Uh, and Lord Hope has come out and said that the chance of a successful legal challenge is very remote. But it's also right on the basis that that was a very bad law uh, and um, has all sorts of risks within it that were not being properly considered. He didn't but, say that, did he? No, he didn't say no, that. No. I'm saying that. No, you no, say, no, I'm no, a, but I'm a backbencher, yeah, so I'm now allowed to say these things. Yeah, no, no, well, already we're getting... Yeah, you know, already right. you're, <laughs> you're free to speak. No, that's good. There was a piece written by Sherelle Jacobs in yesterday's Daily Telegraph... And it was written by somebody who was a passionate Brexiteer who is bitterly disappointed uh, with, with what has not been delivered uh, since that general election at the end of 2019. Now, we do have an important piece of legislation going through the Commons at the moment. Uh, you were very involved in this yeah. from the early days. So are we going to be successful? Are we going to scrap thousands of EU laws? Yes. But the, I mean, assuming the House of Lords doesn't try to block it. And I think they won't because... It got through the House of Commons with large majorities, tiny rebellion. Four Tory MPs voted uh, for one amendment. Yeah. So it's got a lot of support in the Commons. It's a clear consequence of Brexit. It has strong arguments for it on a technical basis in terms of tidying up uh, the um, statute book, which is, is important. And it is an important restoration of the common law for our way of doing things. And I, I, Charles Jacobs is a very good columnist and is always interesting, mm. but I think she was much too gloomy. But Brexit 
is a means to an end in the, uh, in the end. That what are we trying to do? We're trying to govern ourselves. And you and I think that if we govern ourselves, we will do it better because it gives us an opportunity to have low taxes, to be more yeah. deregulatory, to have an immigration policy that suits us, <clears throat> and so on. There is always the risk with Brexit that the electorate decides to elect a left-wing government that doesn't want these benefits. But we accept that and indeed embrace that because we believe in democracy as being fundamentally more important. It's actually Tony Benn's thing that he would rather have um, a bad parliament than a good king, because ultimately a good king will and you fail. You can sack the parliament, and, you, and we couldn't sack the European That's Commission. Right. I get that. But do you understand the anger and frustration that Britain's small businessmen and women are feeling, the fishing community are feeling? They're saying, hey, we back this thing. We're not feeling... We haven't as yet felt no. any benefit at all. And we should do more. We, we should be punchier about what we're doing to help small businesses. I, I, for example, I, I think it's a pity we haven't taken this, particularly help small businesses, but help consumers, taking 5% VAT or, or, or fuel. Um, I, I, I think we should be doing things... A Brexit benefit would have been a clear. A Brexit benefit. Everywhere. So right, why right. does a Conservative Party with an 80-seat majority on the back of Brexit not do these things? There is... Partly it's been working through what can be done. Partly the legislative process takes longer than you might like. Partly some of these things are happening. So there is a bill before Parliament to um, deal with uh, financial services. Solvency mm, yeah, 2 will be dealt with. Um, there's the gene editing bill, which is very important. Um, and do you know, this hasn't been much picked up, but you'll like this. We have saved £191 billion. Pounds. Forget the £350 million a week, £191 billion mm. pounds by not being part of the Covid rescue package of over €2 trillion. Well, Euros. Do you know what? I that wish, is a success. Well, I in wish its that own. was being shouted rather well, more loudly. I, I genuinely do. I put it in an article in the Telegraph, and I mentioned yes. it in the House of Commons. And well, I'm more doing my bit. No, you are, but, and you also now you can do. And it you too. also said, you also said that if the civil service go on strike on the first of February, wouldn't even Nobody notice because they're all working from home. Well, if, I, I love this idea that they're going to be standing outside their own house with a thing so you do not quite cross its picket line. So who will, will they be able to go into their house for supper? Jacob, a pleasure. We Great look forward pleasure. to you being a very outspoken campaigning backbencher. Now, that's enough from Jacob, but I'm going to tell you something about Jacob. You see, there's been a bit of gossip going around. Indeed, the Express Online have run an article today saying Jacob Rees-Mogg, Brexit champion, is gearing up to launch his own TV show on GB News. Now, I won't embarrass Jacob by asking him whether this rumour is true or not, because not long ago he was a minister and the correct period of time has not elapsed before he's allowed to say any other ventures he's going to move on to. I just hope that we'll be seeing a lot more of Jacob Rees-Mogg on GB News. I really hope the rumours are true. <laughs>